Hello, friends. So one of my favorite things about Theology and Raw is engaging with my Patreon community. So we're going to do something special with my community that I've actually never done before. My family and I, we are going to record the first ever, what do we call it? Sprinkle Family Theology in the Raw episode where we will respond to questions sent in by my Patreon supporters. I'm actually kind of nervous about this episode because I've been encouraging my wife and kids to be super honest with whatever question comes in. And I'm honestly a little scared about what they're going to say. So um, we're going to do it. It's scheduled. We're going to roll the dice with this one. And we're going to release this bonus episode exclusively to the Theology and Raw Patreon community in early December. If you want access to this crazy episode, then you need to first join the Patreon community at patreon.com forward slash theology in the raw and joining Patreon not only helps support the Theology in the Raw ministry, but it also gets you access to all kinds of premium content, um, monthly Zoom chats, special written content, monthly bonus Q&A episodes, and much, much more. Again, that's patreon.com forward slash Theology in the Raw. I will see you there. Hey, friends, welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. My guest today is a pastor from Tennessee uh, named Jared, and um, this is going to be a different sort of Theology in the Raw episode, and I, I do want to say up front that I, I sort of broke my rule. Uh, my rule is that I just simply don't engage people on social media in any sort of like debatey way. Like if someone says, you know, you believe two plus two equals five, like I just don't respond. I just, first of all, you know, um, social media occupies about maybe point. 1% of my mental and spiritual energy, any more than that, I think is very unhealthy. And so I've made a rule many years ago, just not, not to engage people on social media. Um, I'm much more interested in long form, uh, conversations and, um, you know, lengthy written responses and, and things that just aren't in this kind of sound bitey environment. Anyway, I broke my rule. Um, there, uh, was an individual that, uh, Jared, who, uh, uh, said some things about what I believe and, um, what my ministries represent. And, uh, I think as you'll hear that, uh, he was not, uh, representing what I believe accurately. And, um, and again, that's just, I mean, this, this is just Tuesday for me when, you know, somebody would, would do that online. So, uh, again, I typically ignore it, but I broke my rule and I reached out and said, Hey, Jared, would you like to have a conversation about this? I, I um, because I don't think he was representing my views correctly. So, I, I, the goal is, was not to have a debate. I mean, I know that um, Jared, and he, I, 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 I'm pretty sure he would say the exact same thing, that, that we both um, represent two very different um, brands of Christianity, if I could put it like that. We have many differences in our beliefs. So I'm not, I'm not here. I'm not really interested in, in debating those. All I'm interested in is saying, you know, you say I believe this. I actually don't believe that. Um, would you please represent my views um, correctly? So that's what this conversation is. I, I can't, uh, I'll just spoil the spoiled up front. Um, I, I don't think even in the next hour and a half that we uh, came to um, an agreement um, that uh, he was misrepresenting me. Um, I do think Jared is uh, lying about what I believe. And, and Jared, as you'll hear at the end, thinks I am lying about various things. So that's where we are. Um, I... Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know what else to say. Yeah. So <laughs> I hope you enjoy this, uh, interesting and, um, kind of different theology and raw conversation. So please welcome to the show for the first and last time, the one and only Jared Moore. Jared, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing well, doing well. Just, uh, we've had a good day. Folks are, folks are gearing up for Thanksgiving and Christmas and, and, uh, always enjoy this time of year. Will you be taking the week off or are you, is it like still a busy week for you? You're a pastor, right? Yeah, I'm a pastor in Crossville, Tennessee, um, Baptist pastor, Southern Baptist. And um, I'll work till Wednesday. And then if okay. folks need visits or something on Friday or, you know, kind of as needed, but just not in the office as much. So Tennessee, where, whereabouts, I, I'm familiar with like uh, the big cities there, Nashville, Knoxville. Whereabouts are you in relation to those? It's right in the middle of I forty between Nashville and Knoxville, and probably what we're most known for now is we have a Bucky's. A what? A Bucky's. A Bucky's. It's. Uh, do you know what a Bucky's is? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm a. I, I live uh, north of the Mason Dixie line, so. <laughs> so you're not a hillbilly, right? Um, <laughs> well, I, I am yeah. from Idaho, so that 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 could be another conversation. Sure, sure. Um, 
Bucky's is out of Texas. It's this giant gas station that has, um, I mean, it's probably got 250 gas pumps and food, and they've got a beaver that is their mascot. And so, so anyway, the first one in Tennessee was in Crossville. Okay. Okay. A bucket. Okay. I have heard that in your parts of the country, some of the best fried chicken is actually at gas stations. Is this correct? That's what I've heard too. Um, I have not tried much gas station fried chicken. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that, that makes two of us. Uh, um, well, tell us about yourself. So you're a pastor and you, uh, are you married, have kids, I assume? Yeah, I'm married with four children. Um, I've been a pastor or in pastoral ministry in the SBC for 23 years and um, went to SBTS for master's and PhD. Okay. Yeah. Um, and your kids, how old are your kids? My oldest is 16 and youngest is nine. Okay. Boys, girls? Three boys and a girl. So we're, we're these, I have four kids, three girls and a boy. Uh, my, my boy is my youngest. And so he's got three older sisters. So we're, 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 uh, yeah, we're, we're in similar state. So we're, my kids are 14 through 20. So just, I guess just ahead of you. What's your, um, if I can ask, what's your favorite thing about being, being a father? Um, I always wanted a little brother. You know, I, I've always loved children, love babies and, um, I would have, you know, 10 kids, but my wife is real tired. <laughs> so <laughs> we wore out and she does most of the work. She stays home with the kids and, yeah, and, um, and so we, we haven't had any more, but, uh, but the favorite thing is just getting to, getting to love, you know, my kids, teaching them, you know, teaching them God's word. They have a, a love for the local church. They have a love for God's word a love for truth, a love for worship. You know, we've, we're catechizing with, um, Baptist catechisms like the second London and the call Col mm -hmm. Hercules Collins version of the Heidelberg catechism. And, okay. um, and so they, you know, they're, they're at church every time the doors are open and that's how they've been since they, since they're little. And, mm -hmm. um, so I, we, we enjoy our, our children. I can't wait to be a grandfather, Lord willing mm -hmm. one day, you know, they're just yeah. such a, they're such a blessing. And I mean, they're, you know, they're yeah. sinners. They're, as Vody Bauckham says, they're, what are they, vipers in a diaper or something like that <laughs> um, when they're little. Uh, but uh, but there's just so much good there in the, the blessing of children. And uh, yeah. I want to help and encourage folks to pursue that blessing. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, I would say... Yeah, I think being a being a father is probably my most meaningful and engaging and and serious and also fun part of part of my life. I think through all the different stages and I don't think there is any one stage that I love more than any other stage. I mean, every stage has its own challenges. We're in teenage years now and it's it's got amazing blessings um and, and unique challenges, you know, but I I do I I do miss the stage when they were like two, four, six, eight, they're all two years apart. I, I, I don't, I do enjoy my sleep now, <laughs> which I didn't get a whole lot back then. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, just those fun. I, I feel like I, 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 and this is probably not good, but I, I often look at the stage I'm not no longer in like, Oh, I wish I was back there rather than savoring the memory of what was and not longing for. Uh, the past, you know, I don't know if you resonate w with that, you know, I mean, there's, I just wish I can kind of like, put on, put on ice, you know, each stage so I can go back and enjoy it, but it's just not, you know, not, not the way it is, but, mm -hmm. um, do you have a favorite hobby that you like to do with or without the family? Man, I just ride. I don't really have hobbies. Okay. I ride and work. Um, since my wife stays home with the kids, I'll, um, try to write books on the side or I sell Yu-Gi-Oh cards, um, sell sports mem memorabilia you know, things like that on the side. Really? So I don't, I don't really have, um, hobbies. My hobbies yeah. uh, need to make some money. <laughs> uh, sports. Are you a football fan? I imagine not baseball or. Yeah, I'm not really a baseball fan. It was always football and basketball, yeah. mainly football, but football has, uh, 
has dampened my spirits a bit. Why you have past, a team that's uh, not doing well or what? <laughs> no, it's just all the critical theory stuff. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, to where making the game about something else. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm a, I only watch baseball and really only follow. Well, yeah, I follow the Dodgers primarily. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you, yeah, we had a really disappointing off season or a post season. So I'm still a little bitter about that, but um, so the Dodgers, the Dodgers, I've got a, I want to say I've got an autograph from one of the old dude from the 1950s. Uh, oh. He's not in the Hall of Fame, but he basically won the series for him. Does that sound oh. right? Um, I probably only know like the Duke Snyders and Sandy Koufax. They're on the Hall of Fame, though. Um, back in the day, if you asked me 25 years ago, I'd probably know the entire lineup by heart of every year the Dodgers have played. Yeah. My, I don't have time to keep up with the history of stats like I used to. I used to be, a, I mean, goodness, a nut when it came to baseball so stats. I can tell you how many RBIs Lou Gehrig had in 1928. I mean, it was, yeah, it was, uh, I just got absorbed with the statistics of it. But um, that, that was pre-life, uh, <laughs> ministry, marriage, kids, and and, and all that stuff. So, um, mm -hmm. well, let's jump in. So I, uh, uh, I, and I, I'm a big fan of honesty as I, I'm sure you are too. So I'm just going to, you know, be honest. Um, I, I yeah. had not heard of you before last week. Um, I came across this tweet that you posted, which was a summary of, uh, Rosaria Butterfield's address. Um, and so I would love to talk about it because, uh, to be honest, I, I don't think it represents what I believe well at all. Um, and I'm, I'll just say, look, I, I'm I'm perfectly comfortable, as I'm sure you are too, with with theological differences. Okay, here's what you believe. Here's what I believe, and 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 maybe there's a place to debate those. That's not. I'm not really interested in that here today, um, unless we can kind of sort through some of the ways I, I think you have uh, misrepresented me. So that's kind of where I would like to focus. Um, so let me just read the tweet. Um, you say, uh, listening to Dr. Rosario Butterfield, uh, what Christian ministries are heretical liars? Uh, Revoice, Preston Sprinkles, Exiles, and Babylon Conference, sponsored by his heretical uh, Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender, and Crew. Um, obviously, I'm not here to, I'm not part of Revoice. I have spoken there, so, but I'm not going to, right now, I'm not, I'll let them worry about themselves. Crew, same thing. Um, but man, I got the her heresy card twice here. <laughs> heretical liars and then a heretical center for faith, sexuality, and gender. And then you, um, we can get in, because then you summarize what heresies or lives, lies that I have spread. Um, so I'd like to end up working through those. But you, so this is not you, I mean, this is your summary of Rosaria, but you believe this. I mean, you tweeted it, you endorsed it. You, These are very much like what you believe too, right? Largely, largely. I'm open to hearing you defend why you believe you've been mis misrepresented. Yeah. Um, you, you may not be aware of this, but I contacted your ministry a couple of weeks ago before all this kerfuffle and asked to come on your podcast to discuss my book that I've written on this subject, which is uh, basically a lay version of my dissertation that was written against... Mm -hmm a lot of the theology that you teach. Okay. Um, yeah, I typically don't, when people ask to be on the podcast, um, to me that that's almost an absolute no. When people ask to me, that's a little odd to ask to come on somebody else's podcast. Uh, if a publisher contacts me, I get this a lot. Um, publishers will say, Hey, we have this book coming out. I'm the publicist. Would I, you know, would you be willing to have it on? Even then I typically take about maybe 10% of those that come my way. Like I, I, Typically, I like to have time to read the book ahead of time, but when when you're getting five emails a day like this, I just can't do that. So, um, sure. yeah, and I don't even hand I didn't even know about the email person. I don't handle all that stuff. But um, that's what I figured. Yeah, whenever I mean I, at I, the beginning here. Yeah. So yeah. So let's. There is so even in the statement, you know, Preston Sprinkles exiles and Babylon conference is a, a ministry that is a I guess heretical liar. I, I, I just want clarity on this. What do you even mean by the conference? Like, is it uh, the people, all the speakers at it? We have a diverse range of speakers. Is it um, me who helps organize it? Is is my wife a heretic? She helps organize it. Is it the, 
the, the booksellers, people working in the bookstore, the volunteers, the people who attend. Like, it just, to me, seems odd to label an entire conference heretical liar. So what, can you give me more clarity and specificity on what aspect of the conference is a heretical liar? Do you have any speakers who are, um, consider themselves trans or, um, perhaps a, a different gender or they're in favor of using pronouns to identify their gender? We, we have a, a whole range of different speakers. So, um, yeah, if, if somebody is speaking on sexuality and gender at the conference, which we've done now twice, um, we do require, like I, I, I would never, I don't want to say never, because I'm all for if there's a public debate or something, obviously you would have somebody at the conference that um, holds to a different view. And we do some of those. We do kind of dialogical debates where we have people with different viewpoints to um, hash it out. We had different viewpoints on the doctrine of hell one year, um, different viewpoints on the problem of evil. So that would require us, obviously, to have people at the conference speaking the different viewpoints. That said, um, per, for me personally, if somebody is speaking into the conversation around sexuality and gender, um, I do require, I would only have speakers that uh, affirm a historic Christian view of marriage, namely that marriage is by definition a union, a covenant union, lifelong covenant union between two people of different biological sexes from different families, um, and that all sexual activity outside of that covenant bond are sin. So that's what I, it's a brief summary of the historically Christian view of marriage. Now there's going to be diversity within that. Some people might use pronouns. Some people might not use pronouns. Some people might use different words to describe their experience. Um, you know, some people might prefer same-sex attracted. Some people might uh, prefer the term gay. And I know we're obviously have disagreements here. Um, but yeah, so when it comes to people speaking on questions around sexuality and gender, I only have people that uh, represent the historic Christian view. So to your question, so specifically, yes, I would, I would have somebody that would be fine using someone's uh, pronouns that do not match their biological sex, but match their gender identity. Um, and other people that say, no, I won't use pronouns. Like I, I would... I would be uh, perfectly comfortable, all things considered, you know, uh, if somebody holds to differences on those, on those issues. So, so if, I, if I'm hearing you say, so the, I, well, um, the fact that, so say I have 18 speakers one year, if one of them or two of them holds to those pronouns, you would say that you would be comfortable saying the conference as a whole is a heretical liar. Is that right? Are you presenting these people as legitimate faithful well, let, let me before you answer that can you answer my Christians. question though yeah <laughs> if, if one or two or three people maybe again holds to a historic christian view of marriage but might use someone's preferred pronouns then you would say you would be comfortable saying my exiles in babylon conference that i help put on i shouldn't call it mine i mean i help put it on um is just categorically heretical I would say categorically heretical if you're allowing heretical speakers to speak. It doesn't matter how many. If there's okay. just one, um, I mean, think. Of, imagine if this was another sin. Like, uh, imagine if someone, you know, they they're having a conference, and you know, ninety percent of their people are biblically foundationally orthodox, but then they've got one that's a white supremacist that speak speaks. And I know this is apples and oranges, but you got to understand when you talk about the biblical sexual ethic, you really think that there are people in church history who would go along with this identifying as a different gender or pronoun hospitality or all this nonsense that is just worldly. It's just worldliness. And, and so you are legitimizing when you present you allow a speaker to come speak who's involved in that you're legitimizing it right i mean are 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 you not it, it's i not mean I, I i'm just trying to get i just want clarity on what you mean by that conferences is, is uh heretical so i mean i don't want to get lost in the weeds at this point yet that um you know if somebody uses the term you know transgender to describe their gender dysphoria you would say that's heretical that's unorthodox all that stuff I'm I'm perfectly fine with you having those uh, thoughts. Uh, so w would you? So if somebody is just to get, and this is a, I'm genuinely trying, I'm not trying to corner you. Like if somebody 
is attending the conference, you're not saying they are a heretic or like my wife or some of my kids help, you know, with social media, like, are they heretics or what, where do you draw the line between, um, who is a heretic in their association with the exiles in Babylon? Like Matt Chandler spoke at it, Francis Chan, we've had, I mean, Jackie Hill Perry, like if any other speaker comes, are they a heretic or would you just simply say, I believe that the conference as a whole is a her heretical conference, but like Matt Chandler isn't necessarily a heretic. I just want to shield my speakers too. Cause they're, if they're, they're, they're not hearing the like, Oh, I'm speaking at this heretical conference. What's the deal with that? I'm like, well, I, I'll try to get clarity on that. Um, I mean, I, I don't do guilt by association. I think it's unwise okay. for a speaker to speak on the same stage with folks that have pronouns in their bio. Okay. Um, and you, again, you have a problem biblically, and I think church history has a big problem with legitimizing those who would self-identify and participate in worldliness. It's just rank worldliness, mm -hmm. in my sure. opinion. I mean, biblically, I think I can prove that from church history. Like you, you, you speak of the biblical sexual ethic, but what about the biblical understanding of what sex is and gender? Oh, yeah, we'll we'll definitely like get to there. Yeah. Church history, like yeah. how how would you know? There's no way that this that these pronouns in bio and legitimizing that, and some of these folks even yeah. identify, um, you know, contrary to their gender. Yeah, we'll get to that because I, I, there's so many questions I have about what you even mean by that. Um, the one, just so you, my, just in case you care, my audience, um, my, let's see. I have never had at a conference somebody who is biologically one sex and identifies as the opposite sex. I've never had that. Um, I've never had somebody who is transition and is not embracing their biological sex as a fundamental, fundamental part of the human identity. Um, but then, again, this is going to take us far afield into the various ways in which um, the term transgender is used, uh, the, the various implications of, um, using someone's pronouns or even, or even giving space to have different viewpoints on that. But again, I want to, I, right now, before we even get into all that, I just want to get, uh, I have, again, I have no problem saying you can still say, yeah, I hear you still think you're a heretic. I'm totally fine with that. I just want to make sure that my viewpoints are represented correctly. So let's get into some of the, um, uh, the specific heresies and lies that uh, we have spread. Um, the first one is the one that I think I don't, I think I'm, I think I feel fairly well represented here. You say same sex attraction is a sinless temptation and only a sin. If you act on it, that that's, I would, I wouldn't, I might tweak the wording here. I think sinless temptation is a little odd. I think a temptation is not, I think it is by def definition sinless unless you give into the temptation. Jesus was tempted. And again, we maybe can have that conversation, but I, I, what you, which I think you're trying to say here, I'm like, I, I feel, I feel that's fairly accurate. Um, I, if you want, so here's how I would, if you want to, I'm assuming you want to like represent what I actually believe fairly, right? Like that should go without saying, like you're not trying to like straw man me or put words in my mouth. That I don't believe. So I, here's how I have the most concise way I have worded it. Okay. That, um, that all sex outside of a male, female marriage is sin. And since we're talking about same sex sexuality here, I would say, including same sex sexual behavior, every kind of lust is a sin, but I would say simply being same sex attracted while being part of one's fallen nature uh, is not a morally culpable sin that an individual needs to repent from it is, is how if that's what you mean by same sex attraction is a sinless temptation and only a sin if you act on it, then I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. And again, I know we have disagreements here. I, I know, um, I, I spent, uh, some time scanning your, your Twitter feed. So I, <laughs> so I, I know we have differences here. The sec, um, any questions about that before can, we go to the second, I, I think the second, third, and fourth ones, and then several other things you've said about me on, on Twitter is really where I want to focus on, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, Biblically, what you just said, and according to church history, you would be a heretic, according to both Rome. I mean, even the Council of Trent condemns you as a heretic, what you just said. Okay. From, from the 1540s to the 1563, 
the Council of Trent, because you're saying that sin is based on the will. You're saying that it's based on mindful willing rather than the fact that it's not it's not based on whether or not it's contrary to God. Same sex attraction is contrary to God. It's contrary to his design. And instead, you're saying, well, only if you submit to it is it sin, even though it's coming from your heart, even though it's coming from your flesh, even though it was produced by the fall. I mean, biblically speaking, both Trent and the Protestants argued that anything in us contrary to God is morally culpable sin, and it's not determined based on whether or not you chose it. Mm -hmm. It's not based on, so you don't go to the mirror to determine whether or not you've sinned, you go to the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the Bible is very clear that we're to love God with all our hearts, souls, and minds. And so how does same-sex attraction, which has turned sexuality upside down, how can that ever love God? How can it ever love our neighbor? That's, that's, yeah, that's an interesting uh, perspective. Again, I would, I would, maybe we, if, we, if we have, uh, depending on how the rest of these points go, we can come back to that. Cause I, I mean, there's several things there I would love to um, perhaps discuss, but I, um, yeah, let's, let's clear up some of this other stuff first before we get back to that. Sure. So, um, okay. So, so point number two, you say, I believe people who experience same sex attraction are actually gay Christians called to lifelong celibacy. So, I first of all, this one's a little bit minor, but I've never used a phrase "actually gay Christians." I would want maybe some clarity on what you mean by that. But I have never ever said, nor do I believe, that people who experience same-sex attraction are called to lifelong celibacy. So that is a, I mean, Jared, that's a lie. So I do not believe that. I've never said that. So I'm asking you. You very much are very passionate about repenting from sin, obviously. Uh, I guess I'm asking, will you uh, publicly repent from sinning, lying about what I believe? I've never said people experience lifelong or same-sex attraction are called to lifelong celibacy. I will read your writings, all of them, and see if you've ever said anything and listen. And if you haven't, yeah, I'll publicly repent. Okay. I, I mean, I'm right here. Problem. I can tell you what I believe, but so maybe well, that, it'd be more yeah. of like an unclarity in my, or de- I could be deceitful writing if, cause I'm right here. I'm telling you, I don't believe that. I, I've never, you, I, I, even you, in my book, from all my, I talk about people who are same sex attracted, married to people of the opposite sex. I've got loads of friends in those, um, you know, uh, in those, uh, relationships. I've always said that there's one sexual ethic for all people, all people who say they're Christians, celibacy and singleness, sexual faithfulness to one's opposite sex <laughs> marriage opposite sex spouse, spouse and marriage. That's one sexual ethic for anybody who claims to be a Christian. So uh, if you're single, then don't have sex. If you're married, then be faithful to your spouse op- in an opposite sex marriage. Um, so yeah, so, I feel free to go read. And if I've ever said that if you experience same sex attraction, you factually are therefore called to lifelong celibacy. Um, yeah, I would love to see you find any statement where I said that because I, I, I've, never, I've never believed that. Uh, I don't believe it. Um, so, does your ministry advocate for that anywhere? Your center for faith for sexuality does it? At, do you agree with everything that's on your website for your ministry? Of course, yeah, I wrote it. Yeah, no, you you didn't write everything on your. Cent- I mean, you've got stuff from Gregory Coles on there. Oh, oh, oh I thought you meant my for- statement. We because we have like a doctrinal statement, a statement of sexuality on the on the front page or whatever. Well, I didn't. I mean, I wrote it and then had other people, you know cross check it. But yeah, we have a, we have a range of other people that write stuff. No, nobody has ever said that if you're same sex attraction, then you are therefore called to lifelong celibacy. So one of the documents on there, uh, from Gregory Coles advocates for queer platonic partnership, non-sexual romance, cuddling well, well, and kissing among same sex <laughs> Christians. Yeah. So uh, forgive me for like you, you want me to apologize. Can for... I, can I real quick, Jared, that, that, that is a different, I, I, I've actually have that written down. We can come back to that. Cause that's another issue I have, but that's, that's not directly related to this lie that you said that if you're, that I believe that if you're same sex attracted, you are therefore called to lifelong celibacy. That is a, that is a lie that is an abomination according to Proverbs six. So 
I mean, I'm telling. I mean, I'm here. I'm t- literally telling you. I don't believe that. Never have believed that. You're telling me that, but when I look at your website and I look at some of these articles that are on there, they seem to indicate the opposite. Like this whole, you've got 45 pages from Gregory Coles, and there's nothing about opposite sex marriage in that entire article. Nothing. And so, look. That article wasn't about opposite sex marriage. I mean, it's you can't. I, <laughs> That's but just you just not said a good that that's the goal. You just said that that's what. If you're single, be chaste, and if you're if you're you know pursuing marriage, then yeah, you know, be like you. You say you're pro marriage, but here you've I, got well, a whole. I didn't. Got a whole I mean, artist. I didn't say that phrase pro marriage. I want to know what you mean by that. Again, I'll say what I believe one more time. If you're single, be celibate. If you are called to marriage, then you're called to marriage and be faithful to your spouse. Whether you're same sex attracted, opposite sex attracted, not attracted anybody is is to me is irrelevant. There's one se- objective sexual ethic for people, regardless of their orientation or sexual attraction. You can tell me that you don't believe this stuff, but then whenever I go to your website and I see entire articles that are arguing for same sex celibacy. Like there, there's nothing about opposite sex marriage. There's not like look, you do have articles emphasizing marriage. Don't don't misunderstand me. But saying that I'm lying whenever your own ministry has things like you. My own be, ministry is my own. Nobody in my ministry has ever said if you experience same sex attraction, you are therefore called to lifelong celibacy. It's that narrow phrase. You're you're going out and finding this article about this and this article about that. And this one doesn't mention marriage or whatever. That's just, I mean, that's just a bad hermeneutic. I need to call Southern and ask who is your hermeneutics professor. I shouldn't have said that. A nice. bad hermeneutic. <laughs> it look, is. Look, brother, you don't have any legs to stand on concerning her- hermeneutics. I should um, I shouldn't have said that. That was a pot shot. I apologize, Jared. That was that was uh yeah, that was that was a dumb statement. Um, but again, I'll come back. So I, I'll say it one more time. Um, you say, I believe people who experience same sex attraction are called to lifelong celibacy. I've never said that. I don't believe that. Um, if you could turn up a statement where I have said that, then I will publicly repent from that. Cause I don't believe that. I don't think that's biblical. It's not something I've ever believed. Um, celibacy and singleness, faithfulness and marriage. That's the broad framework. Do you believe that those are equal? Um, equal callings as far as, or would you say that marriage is the default calling according to God's biological design of male and female and singleness is the exception? We can come back to that. I mean, that's an interesting conversation, but I honestly want to get clarity on you saying basically a line about what I believe. So, so how do we uh, move on from here? So you're not ready to say, I apologize for lying about you would believe, because you don't, even though I'm telling you what I believe, you're not sure you believe me now? I am telling you that there are articles on your website that indicate other than what you're telling me. And so if it's your ministry that is putting things out, maybe you didn't write it, but it is your approval. It is okay. under your ministry. And so if you, it, it could be, so you, you're saying you want me to repent, but it could be that you need to be more clear and get a better handle on your ministry. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Let me, uh, I don't think, I think we're stuck here. Let me just say from my audience, I am, I would highly encourage anybody listening to go, if you're interested, go on my website, read anything I've written um, and see if you can find, again, the specific statement or argument that I think or anybody in my ministry thinks that if somebody experiences, again, let's get the specific phrase, not you wrote an article, it doesn't mention marriage or whatever, but like that if you experience same-sex attraction, you are therefore called to lifelong celibacy. So I would, I'm very comfortable having my audience go check out our website, scour my books, foot, I got a lot of footnotes. Maybe it's, you know, go in the footnotes, uh, look it up and down. I'm, I'm, I'm saying I've never believed that. Um, so either I'm, yeah, m- maybe I've been unclear and I've said that and maybe, maybe it's unclear that that's, that's possible. Um, I'm pretty confident. I mean, I, my editors would have caught something so sloppy because I said, this is just a theologically disastrous claim. So um, let's move on, Jared, if you don't, is that cool? Can we move on? I don't think we're yeah, going to get anywhere here. 
But you, so if you don't find this, this phrase, then, then you will publicly repent from lying about what I believe. I have no problem publicly repenting if I have lied, but that's going to be a big ask considering all the nonsense that has been put out by your ministry, Preston. Okay. Like, I mean, it's going to have to be like, you're saying that exact phrase. Well, did you imply it? Like, what have you actually said surrounding these issues? What have Mm -hmm. people at your conferences that you have approved said? What is your ministry been pushing and emphasizing? Like, all that, Mm -hmm. it's not just what Preston Sprinkle has said from his own mouth. It's what your ministry has put out. Mm -hmm. And so... Look, I, I'm will. I have no problem publicly repenting of public sin. Okay. Um, okay, fair enough. Let's move on. Uh, number three, you say people who experience same sex attraction rarely. I go. Sorry, sorry. This is your. Well, it's, I guess it's your summary of Rosaria's summary of what I believe. Um, people who experience same sex attraction rarely, if ever, change, and therefore should never pursue heterosexual marriage. I have never, ever said that, nor do I believe that people who are same-sex attracted should never pursue heterosexual marriage. This, is, I guess, is the other side of the coin <laughs> uh, from the last one. So this, we could be, I don't want to just, um, I don't know, we could, we could repeat what we already said, but I guess I'm asking you, will, re, will you repent from the sin of lying about me saying this? Because I have never said that, nor have I ever believed that, that if you're simply same-sex attracted, you should never pursue heterosexual marriage. It's the same answer as the answer on the last question. I mean, so you, th- you think there's, there's ministry, things in my ministry and writings that have either set, argued this explicitly, or I have said things that have implied that if you're same sex attraction attracted, you should never pursue a heterosexual marriage. You, you're saying that there's things that I have advocated for that imply that. Yes. Or you have, you have propped people up or invited them to come and approved of them speaking at your conferences or writing articles for your ministry that advocate for things like this. Can you name any, I, and I don't, I don't, I, I don't like when people say, name me a source as if I come with all these sources or whatever, but I, I am curious, is there um, like, I, 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 I have at least one at least one speaker at Exiles this year who is same-sex attracted, who is married to a man. They have three wonderful kids together. An amazing, amazing marriage. Um, in fact, she wrote a book called The Impossible Marriage, arguing that if you're <laughs> same-sex attracted, you that doesn't disqualify you from being in, in a marriage. She's a good friend of mine. She's on the board. So I, have, I literally have a same-sex attracted person who is married to a man, has three kids together, and she's on the board of the center. So you're still saying that me or my ministry is arguing that if you're same-sex attracted, you should never pursue a heterosexual marriage. That's odd, isn't it? (laughs) She's on my board. (laughs) What's odd, so do you want me to point to Gregory Cole's article again? Like We'll we'll get to that because that article article wasn't even about. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, And not, not just him, but... You've had other speakers. Did you um, did you approve of Greg Johnson's book, Still Time to Care? Yeah, that was a great book. Love that book. I didn't endorse it, but I read it. And I Greg's a friend of mine, so yeah. So you so you're in favor of what he argues in that book concerning, you know, basically that it, this isn't going to change that. That. Okay, so that's that's um okay, so there's two two different parts to this statement. Um and, and I might actually depending on well, so let's let's uh let's make sure we put a bow on this one. So uh I do not believe, nor have I ever believed, nor have I ever said that people who experience same sex attraction should never pursue a heterosexual marriage. That is a uh a deceitful and lying summary of what I believe. So I don't believe that. So there's that. Um, and you're saying you're, you would need to do, or you don't agree. You, you think I actually do believe that or what, I what, think how would, that your ministry, okay, your ministry, either you or your ministry have argued that or have implied really? that or advocated for that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Awesome. I do. Uh, again, I am, I'm more than comfortable for the, my audience to go and see, uh, if any of my writings or my ministry, 
who has a board member who is same sex attracted and in a heterosexual marriage. If if we have ever uh, argued that if you're same sex attracted, you should never pursue a heterosexual marriage. Um, I have platformed uh, many people at my conferences. I mean, these, these aren't these are more offline of testimonies. Just uh, last month in San Diego, wonderful testimony, Jared. You would have loved it. Um, a guy who who experienced the same sex attraction, uh, married to a woman. Um, they got together at, uh, I think thir- they were like th- 13 years old. They've been together since they were 13. One of the most delightful couples I've ever met. He didn't even really start experiencing or realize he was, a, you know, wrestled with the temptation of same-sex attraction until later on. They've been married for several years, have three wonderful, I think three wonderful children together. And we had an amazing um, testimony where they shared about their marriage, how they got together. And, and, um, and that, that happens frequently at the conferences that I, that I do. So, um, but I don't, I, I'm hearing you. I mean, I don't, no matter what I say, you're not going to believe it. You're saying that I'm saying I need to look at your other things that you've argued. Um, Make sure, Jared, it's not. Go ahead. Sorry. Or that your ministry has argued. I don't misrepresent people. Okay. You don't? No, I don't. Now, you think I'm like intentionally headhunting Preston Sprinkle? Why would I? I don't don't know or care about your intentions. I'm just going off the the statement that I came across. Why would I do that? So. My yeah, goal is to present way. biblical truth. You appeal to someone on your board. You act like you don't have any same-sex celibate people on your board. Or do you have any same-sex celibate people who speak at your conferences? Like, I am perfectly fine with somebody. Is this what? So I am perfectly fine with somebody being celibate. And not getting married. Um, yes, I mean, Gre- uh, Greg Coles works for us. We have several people in that category. I'm also equally perfectly fine with somebody same-sex attracted pursuing a an opposite-sex marriage. But neither of these statements say that. You were saying if you experience same-sex attraction, your second point, they must, they are therefore called the lifelong celibacy. Or if you, and then for, therefore you should never pursue a heterosexual marriage. Those are two different things. And that's odd if you're if you're saying like because I have somebody who is celibate and pursuing singleness and being faithful in that that therefore I think they should never that all people in that category should never get married. I and mean, that's an what, odd deduction, don't you think? What I am saying is that you're trying to say, well, you've got someone who has who struggles with same sex attraction that is married that that somehow absolves you or somehow proves that you didn't say this or that your ministry has never said it. And I'm saying, no, you actually do have other folks. I mean, so if someone who is, who is battling same-sex attraction is married, you're saying that proves that you don't teach this or that your ministry doesn't teach it whenever you do have folks who are on the other side that are also associated with your ministry. Um, but we can, we can move on. The same, it's the same answer for all these. If you say you don't, this does not describe you, then I will go back and look at your ministry and look at your conferences, look at your speakers, look at what you have sanctioned and approved of publicly. And if I need to repent publicly, I have no problem repenting. Let me just, uh, maybe this will help. I'm going to go down. So, um, cause I know that there's not a single person we have enlisted that actually believes this. Um, Now, when you start to say, well, you said something that implies it, now we're in a weird subjective land that, I mean, what you say is implied, somebody else is not going to say implied. But again, I'm perfectly comfortable with my audience going and seeing if we have said or done anything that would imply that. But let me just go down the list of contributors here on our leadership. And our leadership team, just so everybody knows, is really broad. There's leadership team. It's anybody who's kind of done something at some point to contribute to our resources we put them on the leadership team. This is not like an active leadership team. In fact, maybe even leadership team could be not the best phrase. Well, oh, I, we use collaborative team. I guess that would be better. So, uh, so let me just go down. So Greg Coles, he doesn't believe any of these things that you said. Uh, Lou Phillips, no. Lori Krieg is in a mixed oriented a married. She's married to an opposite sex spouse. Roger Valci, nope, doesn't believe that. Dave Bielan, nope. Nate Collins, nope. Brad Harper, abs- no, not at all. Uh, Josh Butler, nope. Uh, Julia Sadusky, no. Marhouse, Yarhouse, no. Brandon Branson Parlor, no. Peter Valk, no. Rachel Gilson is in an opposite sex marriage. Uh, Paul Eddy, absolutely not. Uh, none of our board members who I've already mentioned do. So 
Um, nobody, I now, but you don't believe me. So you say, well, they could have said something somewhere else that implied that. And then it's like, well, I, I just throw my arms. I'm like, well, I, okay. I, I mean, I can't control that. I, I can say that none of these people believe either of these two statements, but I don't want to, I we can just keep going around and around. So do you want to go to the next one or do you have anything else to add to that? Sure. We can go to the, we can go to the next one. Okay. Um, Number four, sex and gender are different, and God doesn't care if men live as men or if women live as women, uh, because all you need to do is grow in the fruit of the Spirit, as if the fruit of the Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit, can grow can grow from sin. So I have never said, nor do I believe, that God doesn't care if men live as men or if women live as women. I would want maybe a little clarity on what you mean by, and here it might be tough because. I think you're qu- quoting. I didn't hear Rosaria ever use these exact words. Um, so I think this is your, but if she did, so anyway, you endorse this phrase. So what do you mean by God doesn't care if men live as men or women live as men, women, maybe unpack that for me and then I'll let you know if I believe that or not. This is a direct quote from Rosaria. Okay. Um, so just like the pronouns in the bio, I mean, is, is one example. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that implies that y- sex and gender are different, does it not? I don't, you put I don't pro- know which, I don't use pronouns in my bio. I would never do that. So I don't know what you're talking about. So none of your speakers do at your Babylon conference. So, Jared, do they? Trying to under trying to unpack exiles in Babylon for you is not going to make any sense because we have a diverse range of speakers. We do not have speakers that I agree with. We have I have speakers that come that um I even invited people that weren't even Christians. Why? Because I want to hear from the story of why somebody was a Christian and is no longer a Christian. Like, and I want to hear from the actual person. So the whole nature of the conference, I I just you're not going to even be able to understand kind of the, what we're doing there. That's just, it's just, it's just going to be categorically different. That would take us too far afield. So, um, no, I don't, I don't. So, so to say it, no, I don't police people, whether they put pronouns or not to come and speak at the conference. And I know that probably doesn't make any sense to you, but I'm, I'm fine with that difference. I'm perfectly fine with you saying, I think they're therefore you're heretic. I'm like, great, cool. Let's move on. I'm just more interested in you accurately representing what I personally actually believe. So, I have never said, nor do I believe that God doesn't care if men live as men, uh, men or women as live as women. Brother, by you endorsing folks that come and speak at your conference who teach things like this. I mean, Rosaria quoted. Who teaches that? Your, your conference. Who? Your, some of the speakers use pronouns in their bio. That's a different question. No, it's not. It's it sex is. and gender are separate. Like that's literally sex and gender. If you use pronouns in your bio, you're saying that sex and gender are separate or different because you're not necessarily. Not you're necessarily. Identif- well, then why do you have pronouns in your bio? You're trying to identify. I don't have pronouns in my bio. <laughs> Let's get but back you to endorse your- people who do. You endorse people who do, and that's the issue, Preston. Like you, you're saying. You, you keep pointing to yourself, I never said this, but you publicly approve of those who say it. First of all, I don't publicly approve of that. That is a speaker's whatever they want to do. We don't police those things. If someone wants to use pronouns in their bio, um, then they can do it. If not, they can. They don't need to do it, whatever. There's no requirement for or against. To us, it's not... Um, we don't police speakers and whether they want to do that. I'm more interested in God doesn't care that my ministry endorses or that I endorse that God doesn't care if men live as men or women live as women. I mean, I wrote literally a whole book on this topic. Have you read my book and body Jared or no? Okay. Um, that, uh, yeah, I, I would encourage you to, to go read it. Cause I argue extensively in the entire book that biological sex determines whether we are male, male or female, and that we should embrace as Christians, we shouldn't, sorry, you're, I'm, 
while we go here, uh, that as Christians, we should embrace that reality. And if we raise a question, Jared, the leading question I raise in that book is if someone experiences incongruence between their biological sex and their internal sense of self, which one determines who they are? How would you, how would you answer that? I'm curious how you'd answer that question. If someone experiences some kind of incongruence, they experience a disconnect between their biological sex and their internal sense of self, which one determines who they are? First off, let me just point out something, Preston. You don't want to answer the question. I mean, it's a real easy one, man. I'm throwing you a softball. (laughs) No, I'm I'm happy to answer the question, but you're moving on from something I want to discuss first. Well, this is... Again, this has to do with God doesn't care if men live as men or women as living. I, women live as women. I, I, I want to say focus on that specific phrase because this is one of the four statements that were said about me that is just fundamentally not true. I Sex don't believe that. Injury. I don't say that. I have not argued. I've argued in a sense the opposite in my book. Again, maybe as a sub, I do want to get clarity on what you mean by men living as men. If you mean men, uh, you know, can't wear pink and can't grow their hair long and must like sports or some of these gender stereotypes. Cause some people mean that Jared, that that's, or if a woman doesn't like to wear a pink dress and, and likes to watch action movies and smoke cigars, then she's like disobeying God because she's acting like a man. There could be some specifics of what you mean by living as a man, living as a woman that maybe there we would have some, some disagreement that I'm, I'm happy to say, yeah, I don't believe what you believe with that. But I believe that, God created that, that biological sex is a fundamental part of human identity. Genesis 127 makes that really clear. A Judeo Christian view of the human body never separates human body, the human body from, from one's personal identity. So that's, that's what I actually believe. I mean, I spent a whole book writing about this, argued extensively from scripture, going through Genesis 1, 1, to 1 and 2, 1 Corinthians 6, Romans. Uh, we looked at 1 Corinthians 11, looked at Deuteronomy 22. Uh, Romans one and other passages. Um, so I, so I don't think this I is answer, yeah. before I answer that question. I'm still on sex and gender are different. All right, you say we don't police whether or not folks use pronouns in their bio before they come speak at the conference. But if someone had like a Confederate flag in their bio, or if someone was a white supremacist or said something publicly mm-hmm. like that. Y'all would police that. There are things you would police. There are certain things that people embrace and believe that we would not um, platform. Um, Yeah, I would not. I would not. I mean, I would not have you come speak at my conference, Jared. (laughs) Um, uh, But I would consider whether someone uses pronouns. That you wouldn't have me come speak at your conference. I would uh, argue what literally every Christian believed for 1,700 years. I mean, it's amazing to me that. Yeah, that that's just a, that's an admission. I so I, I will again. I, I am I am perfectly comfortable with with whatever disagreements we have, Jared. I am only interested in accurately representing us. So yes, I I so if you if you, I'll I'll say this: if somebody puts pronouns in their bio, or if somebody um, says I will use somebody's pronouns as a matter of accommodation, perhaps hospitality. Um, that do not match somebody else's biological sex. I know you think that's heresy. Um, I don't believe it is. So that's a difference we have. Um, That doesn't mean that I believe God doesn't care if men live as men or women live as women. But I think you would probably say it does, right? Like, again, I want clear. You would probably say if I allow a speaker at a conference with a diverse range of speakers that has pronouns in their bio, you... I want to summarize your view correctly. I don't want to straw man you. You would say, if I allow a speaker at this conference who does have pronouns, then I therefore think that God doesn't care if men live as men or women live as women. Is that an accurate representation of what you would believe? I'm saying that you're sanctioning that sex and gender are different. And that concerning God doesn't care if men live as men or if women live as women— I would say that that refers to your sanctioning of same-sex attraction because the most unmasculine thing that a man can do is be attracted to another man. And the most unfeminine thing a woman can do is to be attracted to another woman because entailed in biblical masculinity and biblical femininity, according to Genesis 2, 
is God literally took a piece of the man and made the woman. And then he's missing something from his body. And then he, she's missing something. And so God brings the two back together to become one flesh. And that includes what it means to be masculine or feminine. And you're, you're saying that sexuality seems to be separate from biology, it sounds like. Okay, so I want I would I do want to come back to sex and gender are different because I think that's yeah that's that's important to tease out. Um, so I- am I hearing you say that if say I believe that um, somebody experiences same sex attraction, then they are not living as a then they are a biological let's say for instance a biological male who. You would say if they if biological male experiences same sex attraction, then therefore they are not living as a man. Would you? Would you? Because if that's what you mean by this, then I guess I might. I wouldn't word it this way. I mean, this is so super misleading and unclear. But if that's what you mean by that, then I guess I can say sure. I guess that's. I, I would agree that we disagree on that. I'm saying saying it's not sin. Number one. Okay. Number one. And then number two, I'm saying that you believe you can sublimate that, that you can sublimate homosexual orientation. Is that correct? You can turn it to something holy? I don't even, uh, I mean, I would need to unpack that's a whole, that's taking us to a different direction. I, I guess I, I, I just want to f- get clarity on this one statement because I, th- I think you're misrepresenting me. So I want to make sure that you either are or aren't, but I, I do, I want to understand what you're saying here that God, again, specifically that God doesn't care if men live as men, men or women live as women. Cause there's people right. saying like, Preston, do you believe that? I'm like, no, I don't believe that. Like, where'd you get that? I'm like, well, so-and-so said or whatever. I'm like, well, I, I've never said that. I don't believe that. So that's why I'm trying to get clarity here. It sounds like, again, you're once again, lying about what I believe um, when I don't believe that. But again, I, I, did you, I, I, I'm, when you say men, can you define when you say men living as men? Men living what as does men that mean? would be not being sexually attracted to other men. Something that ah, you say okay. is not, something you say is not sin. All right. And something I believe you say can be turned to holiness or it can be uh, turned in a way that does honor God. That you say that homosexuality or homosexual hom- orientation cannot be reduced to the sex act, that there are non sexual, non genital um, things that are entailed in homosexual orientation that can be sanctified. Is that what you believe? Um, I, can I come back to that? Because I, I do want to put a bow on this because I'm more than happy to unpack what I believe about which, what you're getting there. Um, you don't I, think so that here, that's here's, a, here's my recommendation. Rec- if. if my recommendation, Jared, please hear me. This is, I know some of these things can get caught to where you're trying to like corner somebody, whatever. I, I, and, and I, I want to, this is a genuine recommendation. I don't think, I think we have very different views on what men living as men is. So I don't think this is a helpful phrase for you to use, use to describe me because what you mean by this phrase is, is, quite different than what most people are going to hear. Like this doesn't, if you want to say Preston believes that um, somebody can be same sex attracted and still be a godly man as a man and remain single. How dare he? He's a heretic. If you want to say that, I'm totally fine with that. Cause yeah, I do believe, I actually believe that. I believe somebody can be same sex attracted and be a godly man, depending on what they do with that attraction. So I, I totally believe that. I'm perfectly fine with you saying I believe that. But when you say I believe God doesn't care if men live as men or women live as a men, and that, that's just a very, at the very least, it's it's somewhere ranging between a full-on lie to a very misleading statement of what, what I believe. What if I say that Preston believes that a man who's having same-sex tr- desires, that he can act on those and glorify God if they are non-sexual, non-genital. What if I say that? You I don't even that? know what you mean. I would. Uh, here's let me let me summarize. I mean, you could say Preston believes that simply being same-sex attracted is not a morally culpable sin. Same-sex lust is a sin. Um, same-sex sexual behavior is a sin. But if you simply 
experience same-sex attraction. That is not what I would consider a mor morally culpable uh, sin that somebody needs to repent from. Uh, can See, I give you an like, can I give you an, and so if you if you say that that's just that's actually what I believe and what I think what I think I've said and written ever, everywhere else like there's a chance I might have said something off the cuff that wasn't that exact wording but that that is what I that is what I believe now yeah sorry go ahead that, that's that's heresy according to church history what you just said okay that's that's fine that you believe that um I, as no, long as you as long as you say that phrase it, it's a fact brother I mean you you need to go read. All that church, what church history, like, I know you, I know you're well read. I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not making a negative statement about your reading or anything. Um, yeah. But on this subject, you're terribly mistaken from church history. Even if your distinction between lust and this pre lust desire, that is absent from church history. Okay. That's just, Fine, yeah. it's just absent. I mean, Eastern or Western? You, I'm curious. East, Eastern or Western you, church history? You're an interview. You're you're an innovator. Is I mean, is what you are. You're you're you have the modern Roman Catholic position, which basically from the 1700s forward, especially okay. expressed in the most recent Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. But but the Council of Trent would call the modern church, Roman Catholic Church heretics for their yeah. their understanding of sin. Yeah. Um. And so so anyway, I I'm, I I'm fine. Hijack, That's fine. Uh, I you can you can. I'm totally fine with you saying Preston, according to church history, is a heretic, as long as you summarize what I actually am saying and believe. And that's, that's honestly my only, my only concern. This episode is sponsored by Haya Health, a children's nutritional supplement that's actually really good for them. So I first heard about Haya through an advertisement uh, on another podcast, and I immediately thought, man, I wish this was around when my kids were young. Uh, it can be so difficult. As you know, if you're a parent, you know, it can be hard to get your children uh, to consume all the nutrition that they need. And this is where Haya can help. Because let's be honest, most children's uh, vitamins are basically like candy in disguise. They're they're filled with sugar, unhealthy chemicals, other gummy junk that kids shouldn't eat. That's why Haya was created. It's a pediatrician approved, super powered, chewable vitamin. And while most children's vitamins are filled with sugar, Haya is made with zero sugar and zero gummy junk. And it actually tastes good. Like I tried it myself and I was shocked at how good it tastes for being so packed with so many vitamins and nutrients. Haya is uh, pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, uh, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. It's non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else that you can imagine. So uh, we at Theology and Raw, we worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. You can receive 50% off your first order. That's a lot. Um, to claim this deal, you must go to hayahealth.com forward slash TITR. This deal is not uh, available on the regular website. So you actually have to go to the, the this website. So uh, H-I-Y-A health.com forward slash TITR. Uh, it's all in the show notes and get your kids the full body uh, nourishment that they need to grow into healthy adults. So I, I don't, again, I don't want to kick a dead horse here because there are a few other things to get to. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of at a stalemate here on God doesn't care if men live as men. I, I, yeah. Let me just say it one more time, I guess. I think that's, that's, I don't believe that. I think we're going to have different definitions of what we each mean by men living as men um, and women as women, but. Well, I think encouraging someone to act on the non-sexual or the aspects of their same-sex attraction is you're you're essentially telling men that part of the way that Adam looked at Eve, um, they're looking at another man that way, non-sexually, because because it comes from homosexual orientation, and you're telling them t that it's okay to act on those desires that are not inherently sexual, but they're still from homosexual orientation. And I, and that is encouraging a man to act on, to essentially act on a desire that Eve would have had, not Adam. Mm, okay. And that is so, the opposite of living according 
to one's design, either male or female. It is a it is effeminate to tell someone who is having same sex desires that there are elements of that same sex attraction that can be sanctified. Telling a man that you're so telling that's, him he doesn't have to live according to masculinity. What do you mean? By, what, how do you, how would you define masculinity? I mean, that might be helpful. Well, it's definitely not acting on homosexual orientation. Number one. What, sorry, what do you mean by acting on? Like having sex I mean, with another dude? or No, I mean, I'm talking about the same-sex friendships that your ministry advocates for. Okay. so that, we'll... um, The celibate partnerships, that that is pure effeminacy that you're okay. sanctifying. You're, you're literally turning biological God's design upside down just in a less heinous way than men having sex with men. But it is still encouraging what you say you don't believe. So you would say, uh, and we'll get the celibate partnerships because if somebody isn't familiar with that, we need to unpack what that means um, and what we have actually said about that. Um, so you would put that in the category though. If, if, if two people are attracted to the same sex, they're committed to celibacy and they are committed to uh, a non-sexual lifelong fr- friendship that that is an example of a man not living as a man. Would you say that that's true? It is because you're you're arguing that it comes from same sex attraction. Sweet. Y'all aren't y'all aren't I'm arguing so- for same sex attracted men to go find opposite sex women to befriend and covenant with or anything like that. You're you're it's literally Go find a same. You desire same sex intimacy because of your homosexual orientation, and you need to go fulfill that. That can be sanctified, is what I'm understanding your ministry yeah. argues for. So, okay, so this is actually helpful. So, if I believe that if you're a man and you're not actively pursuing a heterosexual marriage, then you are not living as a man. Would that be true? Is that what you think? That is, is what not we- what I said. Okay. What I said was your ministry is advocating for gay Christians or same-sex attracted Christians to reject the same-sex sexual attraction, but to sanctify the same-sex attraction by forming these covenant friendships with the same sex, even covenant households. Okay, so okay, so it's the it's the covenant friendships between two people who are attracted to the same sex that you would say that is by definition not living as a man. Is that true? Absolutely, because okay. y'all include same-sex attraction in there. Okay. It's not it's getting two dudes getting together, and <laughs> that's not what it is. Like Y'all are arguing that these guys have non-genital desires for same-sex intimacy that can be fulfilled in same-sex friendships. So it, it's not the same as like me, for having a friend that I'm super close with. That is, that's not what you're advocating because it is particularly gay or homosexual. Y'all include that in it. And I, okay. I even read in your ETS paper that you did in 2014, you, you reference David and Jonathan and Jesus and John as examples of this. And that couldn't be further from the truth. So, okay, again, just to get clarity, I, so I think the problem here, Jared, is that we have different definitions of men, what it means for a man to live as a man, a woman to live as a woman. Um, I'm perfectly comfortable with those differences that we have. Um, I, I still do think that when you say, I believe God doesn't care if men live as men or women live as women, that I'm perfectly fine, for instance, with a biological female uh transitioning and identifying as a male and, and vice versa. That's what I, when I hear this phrase, that's, that's where my mind goes, but you haven't even really mentioned that you keep talking about like sexual attraction and covenant, you know, partnerships or friendships or whatever. Um, I, I feel like this phrase doesn't capture it, it's, it. It misleads people regarding what I actually believe. Cause I think when they hear, when I hear, I think a lot of people would probably hear what I hear when I hear this men doesn't men, God doesn't care if men live as men, women live as, live as women. I don't think people are going to say, well, so you think that people can be same-sex attracted and 
and be celibate and single and have a, a, a lifelong friendship with somebody else who is, you know, celibate and single or whatever. Like, I, I don't, I don't think most people are going to go there when they hear that phrase. So I do think it's misleading. If you want to say, I think Preston's a heretic for not condemning so-called celibate partnerships, which we, which we still need to get to Jared. I understand that. Um, I'm perfectly fine with that. I just Christian, think this phrase isn't the best summary of what I actually believe. Do you usually make a practice of, um, I quoted Rosaria. Mm -hmm. This is my understanding. What I just shared with you is my understanding of what she said. Okay. So, I mean, you can say that people hear something differently. That's not what I heard. I just shared with you what I heard. Okay. All right. So you'd have to ask Rosaria exactly on what you're saying, what you're hearing, because I yep. didn't hear that. Okay. That's fair. Um, with the sex and gender being different, um, what do you mean by, what do you, because for me, I'm like, it depends on what people mean by, I, I'm, that might be an accurate representation of what I believe. It depends on what they mean by, honestly, every single one of these terms, sex, gender, and different, <laughs> we, we kind of need to explore. The term gender in 2023 is defined by 10 people in 11 different ways. So I, I, it's one of the reasons why I, I don't love the term, quite honestly. I try to avoid it when I when I can. Um, but when, um, but it is a term people use, so, so I do discuss it. What do, I guess? What do you mean when you say I think sex and gender are different? What do you mean? What do you mean by gender? Can you define that? You permit folks to speak at your conference who use pronouns in their bio. Just the fact that someone uses pronouns in their bio means that they distinguish sex from gender. What are, what are your pronouns, Jared? I don't have any pronouns. What do you mean, what are my pronouns? Like you don't refer to yourself as he or <laughs> what him? What kind of question is that? What, what, do, you, do, you, do you want me to use he or him to refer to you? Uh, what is that's such a ridiculous question. I'm asking a question. Do you, do you like Why? Do you, Why are you asking that? Because we're talking about pronouns. Question. We're talking about pronouns. That's a ridiculous question. <laughs> okay, here's what I'm getting at, Jared. That's so, uh, so if if a biological male puts he him in his bio, are are you saying that you have a problem with uh, an equal problem with that, or are you saying if a biological male has she her in their bio, is that what you have a problem with, or is it any just list mentioning pronouns? mentioning pronouns why in the world so it's, so it's not the cross sex pronouns that you have it's not just that it's it's simply mentioning pronouns it's all because you are yeah. separating obviously i'm male right like there's male and female that's what there is and <laughs> all these other they them you know um yeah, I, when you 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 have things with your conference that you're going to police. You even said you wouldn't you wouldn't permit me to speak, which is that's hilarious to me considering like what evidently I'm I'm so far out there which I I'm emphasizing what church history has emphasized for 1700 years um and Protestants have emphasized for 2000 um I'm so far out there I can't speak at your conference but you're going to people who have pronouns in their bio, you're going to have them speak. You know, yeah. I mean, you're you're willing to police <laughs> things and I'm I need to be policed. But these these other folks don't. That's just remarkable to me, Preston. It's just yeah. remarkable. Like, I, I would. I um, yeah, I, it, I honestly don't want to get into that. I would encourage somebody to go scan Jared's uh, um, Twitter feed. Um, sure. Go and, scan it. Go yeah, scan it. And and pay attention to how he interacts with people. And I think um, it would be self-evident why I wouldn't have you speak in a conference. But we're, we're not talking. We shouldn't. I mean, we're getting off the rails here. I still, what's your definition of gender? When you say sex and gender, are, I believe sex and gender are different. What does gender mean in that statement? I don't believe sex and gender are different. I believe. What is gender? What is, when you say gender, I didn't even know what that word means. Like if male I was, if I was female. from. Male what? or female. So what's if sex? So what's sex? Every, listen to me. No second. wait. What's wait wait? <laughs> I I just I just want definition so I can so we can move on and and discuss this. What's your definition? Are you saying they're synonyms? Sex and gender are referring to the exact same thing. I'm saying that biologically, 
sex and gender are the same thing concerning if everything was healthy in an individual, males produce small gametes, females produce large gametes. All right. That's what, that's the way I would define male mm. or female. And that's sex or is that gender? Is, is that sex? Both. The whole so point gen- here is so that we're, sex we're quick, and gender gen- are not different. So sex and gender are, are synonyms you're saying? I believe they're the same. So I could say if they're the same, then how are they, how do I believe they're different? If the term gender means sex and if sex means gender, you could equally say sex and sex or gender and gender. So does it make any sense to you that I believe say sex and sex are different? Like I don't. It makes no sense to me that you would, you would endorse people who put pronouns in their bio because they are publicly That's a different saying, question. That's no, a different they're question. publicly saying that their that, sex is different from their gender. That's what they're what's saying. What's gender? What's gender mean? I still when you use, when, when the word gender comes out of your mouth, I don't. I still don't. You just said that gender means sex. So if you put I'm pronouns in there, so someone puts pronouns in their bio, bio, and gender means sex, and you're saying that sex and sex are different. I don't. I I don't know what you mean by gender. Listen for a second, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they're saying sex and gender are different. I'm saying Which they're not. So what's okay? Okay, 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 okay. So sex and what do they? Different. I'm saying they're not. Okay. Do you understand? So, do you understand the difference? Well, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I'm trying to get there. Um, you're so you use the term gender as a synonym for sex. So there is, and you're trying to summarize what somebody else means by gender. Can you? Okay, maybe that's where we need to go. What do you think? Because this is a claim. C- can we deal with me first and then talk about other people at the conference? Because I, I, I just, you keep bringing it to like speakers at my conference and that's just a whole nother conversation about the nature of the conference. But your conference I, was named by Rosaria is the only reason I'm mentioning it. Like I didn't say this, but this is what Rosaria says. You ask me why she says things like this. And then I point out this about your conference and you're like, well, we don't police whether or not people use bio, you know pronouns in their bio, but by someone using a pronoun in their bio, they are separating their biological sex from their gender. They're saying, obviously I'm male or obviously I'm female, but here are my pronouns. Mm-hmm. Well, why, why are you listing your, your pronouns if sex and gender are the same thing? Not everybody that lists uh, pronouns in their bio would, would agree with that statement. But again, that's, that's taken us... I mean, people put pronouns in their bio for all kinds of different reasons. Um, so they're not necessarily saying, I believe sex and gender are different. What do you think people mean by gender when they u- distinguish between sex and gender? Because I'm not, I'm not 100% sure I would even agree that I think... So here, here's where I'm coming from. I, I'm not quite sure if this is an accurate representation of what I believe, because I'm not sure, I guess, what you mean by gender... If you mean one thing, then I would say, no, I don't think sex and gender are different. If you define it another way, then I might say, yeah, according to that definition, I might say, yeah, I think that those are different. Um, or I can, I can maybe, do you want me to say what I... I've told oh, you that I believe that gender and sex are the same thing, that they're determined by God. And you cannot self-identify contrary to your biology, contrary to God's design of you. But that is what the distinction, when you say that sex and gender, when you say the well, pronouns are something you know biblical or something that I can use and be faithful to the Lord, um, you're separating your gender from your biological sex by someone what, saying, What's my gender? Pronoun, <laughs> It is so, pretend like I'm not, pretend like I don't speak English. So instead of using the term gender, maybe insert a definition for this word that I'm hypothetically unfamiliar with. Because again, the term gender can be used so differently with different people. I just I need to know when you say you separate sex from gender, I need to know what you mean by the term gender because that's a claim about what I believe. What am I separating? What am I separating? Biology from from saying what you are, like biology from like. It's the same thing as someone, I don't know what that means. someone who is a biological male saying they're a woman. They're separating how God designed them from 
what they are saying they are. They're saying their gender is different from their biological sex. Someone who uses pronouns in their bio are at least implying the same thing. I, I, I still hang about the gender thing, Jared. I So if somebody is separating sex from gender, they're separating sex from fill in the blank. They're separating what they are biologically from what they say they are. They're identifying contrary okay. to their design. It's based on a choice in the head. Like it, it, they're saying something contrary to God's design. So if that's so what gender, you mean, if that's gender, what you mean by people that claim sex and gender are different, then I don't believe that. Because again, I've already argued extensively in my book Embodied that biological sex determines who you are. If you are biologically male, then you are factually male, regardless of whatever incongruence you experience. I mean, it took me seven, eight chapters and three years of research to... Um, argue that so um then why would you have someone speak at your conference who has pronouns in their bio i would have first of all you are assuming that if you simply list pronouns in your bio that you therefore believe sex and gender are different that is not necessarily the case and um you and i can disagree to disagree on that you think by definition if somebody lists pronouns in your bio then therefore you do think that um, people who are male can say identify as female. I, I'm saying uh, that's just factually not true. I know people that list their pronouns in a bio for all kinds of different reasons. Jared, maybe it would be helpful. I I don't. I purposely don't list my pronouns in my Bible. Uh, bio. I don't. I think it actually reveals a certain uh, view of a theological anthropology that I don't agree with. Um, I. But I don't. This is not to me a matter of like. Uh, um, where if somebody does list their pronouns in their bio for whatever, for various reasons that I would therefore not have them speak at the conference. This is more just the nature of the conference that you're never going to understand, Jared. There's no, I mean, that's just not, and I'm not, again, I'm not here to convince you like, no, the XLs and Babylon conference is something you should agree with. Like, I know that that's not going to happen. Um, so, I am just more interested specifically in people representing what I actually believe and perhaps by extension, what, um, uh, my ministry believes, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Cause I, yeah, the exiles is just, we're not going to get anywhere on that. So, um, for, for my audience, I mean, if they're not familiar, so exiles is a place where we have curious conversations with thoughtful people. Uh, there is no doctrinal statement people need to sign to come. Um, we have a range of different, uh, viewpoints. Um, we often have, uh, De debates like we in this year we have three three different perspectives on politics where we have a left-leaning christian a right-leaning christian and a more anti-partisan anabaptist christian and they're going to present their viewpoints and then they're going to engage in a lengthy dialogue with each other and um and there's going to be differences so by definition exiles has a range of differences that we represent so um but you wouldn't let me come speak though like that it's just amazing to because evidently my tone online is not to your liking, but if I had pronouns in my bio and I was whatever your arbitrary definition of sweetness online is, I'm just direct, man. I just, I believe because I believe the Bible's the words of life. I believe when it cuts us, it cuts us to send us running to Jesus. And, um, I have no problem being direct. And I want, I appreciate you having me on to be direct with me. Cause that's, I think that's biblically lacking. And just honestly, man, I would love to publicly debate you on this first point concerning same-sex attraction um, formally. Yeah, I, I'm honestly not even interested in that. I don't sure. really do debates, and especially, I mean, I don't... Uh, you know, so Rosaria Butterfield even said, you know, we don't throw people away, but without repentance, we don't trust them. We trust repentant saints. I believe you have uh, lied about several things I've said, and I... I don't feel confident you're going to repent from the, the sin of lying, which Proverbs 7 says is one of the several things, six things, yea, verily seven, that God hates. So, no, I'm not interested in having that you debate. Have um, not again, demonstrated, you have not demonstrated that I have lied, all right? So you're saying 
you, you, you have said a lot of things and you have sanctioned a lot of people and affirmed a lot of people and a lot of teachings, right? So to say, well, I never said that doesn't mean that you haven't approved of those publicly who have. And so I'm going to go research that. I'll go look at that. Mm-hmm. But by you just making the accusation that I've lied doesn't demonstrate that I have lied. People who experience same-sex attraction are called to lifelong celibacy. That is a lie. I've never said that and never believed it. People who experience same-sex attraction should never pursue a heterosexual marriage. That is a lie. I've never said that. I don't believe that. Sex and gender, well, this one I don't think we're going to get very far on because I still don't really know when you say people distinguish between sex and gender. Well, I guess I did get a little more clarity on that, so that's helpful. Um, I don't think when you say God doesn't care if that I believe God doesn't care if people if men live as men or women live as women and i think that is at the very least a a gross misrepresentation of of what i believe so um See, but I you haven't read my book so i don't i don't in a sense i'm like it, you're it's not about um, book it's about i believe that sexuality is entailed in biology and you seem to not believe that you seem to believe that um that a homosexual orientation is masculine and I, I, I'm <laughs> saying it's not. Like, do you believe a homosexual orientation is masculine? I don't even. I I don't even know what you mean by both those phrases. Like, what do you mean masculine? What do you mean orientation? Like, we're gonna have different categories of these things. And here, I'm not. I'm just so not interested in like debating these categories with you. So, um, what? So let me let me publicly say, Jared, and I uh, I'm I'm not confident. This is going to change into your mind, but maybe for my audience. So, um, up until several, you know, several decades ago, people use sex and gender as synonyms, like, like, like Jared does that the, the term gender refers to biological sex. The term sex refers to biological sex up until about 50 years ago, people started to make a distinction between biological sex and what some people might call the psychological, cultural, and social aspects of being male and female. Um, maybe we can even say like masculinity and femininity. So, um, if a, um, yeah. And so, so some people would use the term gender now to refer to those psychological experiences or social roles that men and women play. Now, I don't, I don't even, I'm not even saying I agree or disagree with those distinctions. I'm just saying these are how the terms are used in common uh, discussions around trans identities. So I first like to understand how, t- how people are using their terms so that I know what we're even talking about, which is why I've tried to do with you when you use the term gender. So it depends. So it depends what people mean by gender, whether I would sign off on, I think sex and gender are different. If what they mean by gender is like masculinity and femininity and these categories, a lot of times are just culturally defined and influenced. If a, if a, a person is, again, if, if a female cuts her hair short, loves sports, smokes cigars, loves action movies, hates chick flicks, or whatever, some people would say, wow, she's kind of masculine. Um, I'm going to say whatever term you want to, and if someone says, well, that's her gender masculine, I'm like, you know what? I don't even think that's helpful. Um, in fact, I, I don't even think it's, I like to say, a female is a female, a male is a male, and they're going to have all kinds of likes and dislikes and interests in the world. And I think a female should identify as female and a male identify as male. Um, so is the term gender helpful to use as a word to describe these largely personality differences? I don't think it's that helpful. Um, so yeah, I, I don't even, when people say you distinguish between sex and gender, honestly, these are such broad debated categories it's hard for me to understand like i'm I'm not even sure what people mean by that i don't know is that i probably confused you more than i helped jared right is that i mean i don't well it's i'm not thinking of any of those things i'm talking about biology i'm talking about separating again it's, it's back to the pronouns i think it's an implication in the pronouns and by you you know, sanctioning folks and approving of folks who use pronouns in their bio to speak at your conference and to write it, you know, um, or, you know, things that you approve of or people that you approve of that have done this um, is a statement concerning you as well. Like you can Mm -hmm. say you don't, but you at the very least have approved of those who do. And, you know, it's, it's not a lie. It's not a lie 
Um, because it, again, the original quote with Rosaria was not just Preston Sprinkle. Mm-hmm. It was Preston Sprinkle's Babylon ministry and your Center for Faith. So she pointed out, I mean, that's a whole bunch of people. That's a whole bunch of people involved in your conferences, a whole bunch of people involved in your ministry. And it includes anything that you've sanctioned concerning what they've said as well. Let's, um, Jared, we're, I'm sorry, we are getting, uh, I have another meeting here in a second. There's two more things I want to identify that I believe you have lied about. Um, the first one, uh, this is a softball, so this should be an easy, quick repentance on your part. Um, crew has asked Preston Sprinkle to oversee its sexuality curriculum. That oh, this is, is this is meaningless. Huh? That's Rosaria. So you don't That's necessarily agree with that, or you don't. Okay, so you don't. You you don't. So not, you can neither confirm nor deny that statement. So just from what I've seen from Crew's documents, you are heavily involved in their curriculum. Now, are you not? I. They never ask. I don't oversee any of their sexuality curriculum. No. Um, no, no many no. ministries use. Asking, are you hev- Were you heavily involved? in their curriculum? Are there videos of you in their curriculum that folks have to watch? I'm going to use the actual wording here. Crew <laughs> asked Preston Sprinkle to oversee. I'm oh a big language goodness. guy, man. I like, I like, to, I like to go at what people are actually saying. Rosaria. You specifically, are involved. You're involved in Crew's curriculum. There's no doubt about that. You know you're involved in Crew's curriculum. The question, you're, you're talking about oversee. Well, I didn't oversee it. But are you heavily involved in Crew's curriculum. What do you mean by heavily involved? I've never written anything. They use our resources. Loads of ministries use our resources. Liberty University uses our resources. Uh, InterVarsity uses our resources. Tons of people use our resources. So if you think that people simply tap into our resources or read my books, is anybody reading my book? Does that mean I'm heavily involved in their th- whatever if they use my book or use our resources? If that's your definition of heavily involved, then sure, I'm heavily involved in thousands of people's lives because... And you are too. People read your book. I'm a, if I read your book, does that mean you're heavily involved in my ministry because I read your book and if maybe you drawn some helpful things from it? If you put a curriculum and you have your whole board go through it and I'm teaching on some of those videos that they're watching, then I'm heavily involved in that curriculum. So you could I actually mean, be heavily involved in our ministry because we might, if we use your book and draw things that we find are biblical and spit, you know, eat the meat, spit out the bones and quote from Jared saying, here's some things Jared says, then you are heavily involved in my heretical ministry, Jared. <laughs> that is, uh, that is interesting. It's exactly what you said. I mean, it's uh, just logically, that's the same thing, right? You're saying if people use something I said, then I personally am heavily involved. That's fine. So I'm, like, I'm, 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 I'm only, the first, only problem I have, I have no problem if, if you're like, yeah, that's what you mean. That's what it means to be heavily involved. Let, I have no problem with that. Let me phrase it this I, way. Wait, wait, wait. I, I'm specifically that I am overseeing their sexuality Did, statement. That is factually wrong. I am not overseeing it. This is a softball, man. It should be easy. You just say, oh, man, okay, well, I heard you were, but I guess you're not because you're factually not. So, yeah, I apologize. Crew, I repent from my sin of misrepresenting you. you. Money. Preston. Has crew huh. paid you any money? Has crew paid me any money? Uh, first of all, I don't think I honestly can't even remember if they like paid for my resources. Our resources are paid resources. My books are paid books. So Have, that's no. I mean, do you know? Has crew paid for using your materials or your videos for their curriculum? Our videos are, uh, we have paid resources and free resources. So by definition, if they're going to use a paid resource, they would have to pay for it. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's again, just, there's there's loads of organizations no. that pay for our resources. I'm more interested, again, I, I'm not, I, I'm not going to show you my checkbook. I'm not going to show you my bank account or whatever. I'm not All I want to say is it was factually, is factually wrong to say I oversee Cruz sexuality curriculum. Well, then take that wrong. up with Rosaria. I quoted Rosaria. Take it up with her. Okay. So if if you, I thought you, someone, I thought you. I mean, again, I, I, I thought you agreed I, with this statement. So. So if I quoted, if you quoted someone who said something that they had the research, and you quoted it, 
you know, I, I'm assuming that she understood that you were over that. And so if you're asking me if I would quote somebody I that I haven't verified, no, I would never quote somebody saying this is true. And someone's like, have you verified that? Nope. But I still think it's true. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. Um, okay. Can I point out one? There's one more thing, Jerry. Gosh, I'm going to have another meeting that's going to pop in here in just one second. Um, you say Preston Sprinkles Ministry, Ministry, the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender advocates for LGBTQ, quote, pl queer platonic partnerships, non-sexual romance, cuddling and kissing, snuggling in bed. And then you mentioned, for some reason, Rachel Gilson being part of our ministry, not involved in this paper. but um, And then even Rebecca McLaughlin pointed out that this paper is not advocating for. Um, Preston. We say that explicitly in the introduction and in the conclusion. Um, I would Not encourage Preston. people to go. Uh, in this that paper, we, th this is a quote from the actual introduction of the paper. In this paper, we won't deny the value, or sorry, uh, what about, are any of these behaviors that we're going to describe sinful uh, or maybe unwise but not sinful? Are there any behaviors that might be unwise for sin and sinful for some while morally neutral for others? In this paper, we won't deny the value of these questions, but we will focus our attention on listening and understanding what people are currently doing so that we have the knowledge we need to approach these questions with care. And then he summarizes basically what are these things that people call uh I mean, it goes by many different names, sometimes celibate partnerships, sometimes covenanted friendships. At the very end, the last paragraph, uh, Greg Hole says, I haven't, tried in this, I haven't tried in this paper to painstakingly evaluate the relative wisdom and kingdom effectiveness of various forms of celibate partnership and committed friendship. So it is a lie to say my ministry advocates for it is not sexual romance, cuddling and kissing, snuggling in bed. That is factually No, wrong. it is not. No, it's you were lying. <laughs> you were lying. I literally you read the paper, dude. <laughs> this is a positive paper. Imagine if I wrote the same paper, but the sin was white supremacy. That we wow. need to summarize imagine. what white supremacy is and say in this, no, in this that paper is not what you do. You tell That's exactly what we do by definition. I could read it again. No, I won't read it. I, I'm out of time. At the very end, don't lead to conclusions about how a particular celibate partnership or committed friendship works. Second, remember that there are relatively few models of celibate partner. Like you're telling people to go easy on these people who are involved in this. Like you're telling them you're giving directions Third, when it comes to the question of appropriate boundaries on several different registers, including not the, just the physical and emotional intimacy, but also language use, finances, openness to adding members, and so on, consider the possibility that wisdom may dictate different answers for different types of people. This is advocating. That's you advocating. I mean, Summarizing what advocating. they are. <laughs> You didn't summarize your given directives at the very end, Preston. This is just empty rhetoric. You are lying. You need to publicly repent on this. That is a lie, a bold-faced lie to say you're not advocating for this. You put that in the most positive light possible. We described, I, I would encourage my audience to go check it out. It's This is go free on our website. Article. It's called uh, Understanding Celibate Partnerships and Committed Friendships. Uh, Centerforfaith.com, you want to check it out. It won't co it cost you an email, so um, no problem there. Uh, yeah, when it, I, I'm more than happy for my audience to uh, actually read this article and what we explicitly say that we're not advocating for. But I'll leave that for the audience, Jared. We, uh, I guess we will once again agree to disagree. Would really, really love for you to represent my viewpoints correctly. Um, uh, and then I'm fine, perfectly comfortable with the agreement to disagreement. Um, but please do, before you and before God, don't lie about what I believe. I did represent you accurately on that. That is a bold-faced lie on your part. I'm not going to back down from that because you, mm -hmm. you can say you're not advocating, but then you spend 40-something pages advocating. All right, Jared, I got to run. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you. 
Okay, hey friends, um, I wanted to offer some afterward type thoughts on this conversation. Um, it's been a few hours since I uh, got done recording with, with uh, my guest and a uh, bunch of stuff came to my mind. I'm like, man, I'd love to just kind of uh, clear up some things for y'all. So um, in no particular order, I want to first of all begin by apologizing again uh, for the real immature comment that I made about... Um, Jared's hermeneutic professor at Southern Seminary. Not only was that just immature and dumb, um, it could be taken as a negative statement towards Southern Seminary, and I just absolutely um, di- didn't didn't mean that. And I apologize for saying it. I have lots of respect for many many professors at Southern. I have many friends that went there. Um, dear dear people in my life that I have mad mad respect for uh, teach at Southern or I've gone to Southern. So um, that just that was. That was that was dumb, and I apologize for making that comment. Um, also, just to clarify, so I I didn't bring Jared on to debate our differences. That was not the purpose of this conversation. Um, that was, um, yeah, would never have done that. Would never have brought him on to debate. I'm not really interested in that at all. So there was a few times when I know he wanted to debate certain points, and I just didn't want to go there. There's other times I, I think we kind of did go there and you saw how it went. <laughs> That's exactly why I don't want to debate differences. All I wanted to do is to challenge him to stop lying about what I actually believe. Um, so I, ho- I hope that was clear. Um, yeah, there's, there's times when he wanted, wanted to debate certain points and that's just, I'm just not uh, interested in, in debating with him. Um, I'm not really, I don't like the debate genre personally. And some people are love it and they're really good at it. Uh, Sean McDowell is a great example of, I think somebody who handles, uh, debates very well. Um, I think he's honest, he's forthright, he's clear. He can think well on his feet. I just, for me personally, I just, I've never been interested in those kind of like debate conversations. I, I don't mind written debates where you, can have time or you have time, like where you post a blog post or something and somebody else responds or obviously, you know, critical reviews of something I've written. I, I, I like that better personally. Um, but I only like to do that with people that are acting in good faith, that are genuinely trying to understand what you are saying and can offer helpful, uh, critique with counter evidence to, um, in, in a mutual pursuit of the truth. And, in my opinion, maybe you feel differently. In my opinion, I, I don't think um, Jared would be someone who is who I am convinced is genuinely trying to represent what I actually say and believe, and is offering really helpful, rational, theologically precise counterpoints to the opposite. So yeah, so I, I don't like debates in general, and I certainly would not be interested in 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 having a debate with with Jared. But again, that's not why I. Um, wanted to have Jared on. Some people might be wondering, uh, well, why didn't you just have Rosaria on? Um, it's a great question. Uh, first of all, I mean, Jared was the one who posted this, all this stuff about me. And he was quoted, he was kind of summarizing Rosaria's uh, uh, talk that she gave, I believe. Um, and he endorsed it. He very clearly endorsed it. Um, and his post got a ton of attention, like almost half a million views. So it's kind of like, yeah, it was a, it was a big deal on social media. Um, and I took this to mean that he also believes these things. Uh, Rosario's not on Twitter. It's not like she posted it and I could respond to her. I mean, he posted it, got a ton of attention. And so I decided to just respond to him. Um, and second, you know, I'm, I'm not the one running around calling people heretics. So if Rosaria or others think I'm a heretic, uh, I would hope that they would contact me and discuss that with me. Um, but, uh, she hasn't, and, and that's fine. I don't, I don't, um, whatever, like, I don't, I don't really care. Um, but just so you know, I have contacted Rosaria, uh, recently to invite her to have, have a conversation. So, um, I didn't want to talk with Jared and not Rosaria. It was just, he's the one that posted on Twitter. So it was easy for me to just respond to him and have him come on the show and talk about this. I do want to say this. I, I, if, um, if you are, uh, if I can say a heresy hunter and, um, want to come on my podcast to do the same thing or whatever, just please like, don't, this is not what I normally do. This was an exception to the rule. And I'll talk in a second about whether I even should have done this conversation. Um, I, yeah. So I, like I get called a heretic every day on social media and stuff. It's not like if you just yell and yell loud enough and scream loud enough and say something really obnoxious and get a bunch of hits on your 
post against me, then I'm going to be like, Oh, how dare you? I'm going to have you on my podcast. Like that's just, this is not normal. Okay. So please, I don't want to give people the impression that if you just get enough attention on social media, that I'm going to um, invite you to come on uh, the podcast or even really notice it. Like I've honestly muted so many people um, that I, 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 most of the stuff I don't even see. In fact, I, I, I never, <laughs> <laughs> it's almost always somebody else that like reaches out and contacts me. Like I didn't even know about Rosario's comments until somebody, you know, sent me a clip or whatever. And then I look and look on social media and I saw Jared's post or whatever. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't go looking for this stuff and I've muted so many people that I just, I don't see almost, I hardly see all the weird accusations that I get on, on social media. Um, so, I mean, honestly, when I, when I saw Jared's post, I almost just kept, I didn't really think about it. Cause it just, it didn't seem, I, my, my general policy is I assume accounts are a bot unless they prove themselves otherwise by using humanizing speech. And so by how bizarre some of the claims were made, I just, I didn't think it was a real account. <laughs> I did a little more research and I was like, Oh no, I think this is actually a real person. So, um, yeah. So all I have to say, if, if you're a heresy hunter and now you're like, Oh good, I want to, I want to do what Jared did. Like, just, just don't, I mean, it's free country. You do whatever you want, but you're, you're just, you're wasting your time. Um, it did come up. I don't, there's a, I mean, there's several things as I reflect on the conversation and it's kind of a, already a bit of a blur, but, um, there, there was one time when I, you know, made this comment that I, you know, I wouldn't even invite him to speak at the exiles conference. I think that was, it just, that was just a, a distraction. I know he returned to that a few times and I, just to be clear, like, I, I, it's not that like, Oh, I normally would invite Jared to come and speak at the Elgin raw, but, um, but he's kind of unkind on social media. I think that's how he took it. Um, or I think I might've made that comment, like look at your Twitter feed and your tone and stuff like that. That's just, a, I mean, that's just scratching the surface. Why I would never have Jared speak at exiles. I mean, I think he represents a brand of Christianity that's just so categorically, categorically different from the brand of Christianity that I, um, find, uh, close to the heart and truth of Jesus. Um, I, and I, I, I think he would say the exact exact same thing about me. Like, I, I think we'd be very much in agreement um, on that. Um, but also, I don't, I mean, I just don't find his reasoning skills to be up to par with the kind of speakers I find interesting enough to speak at Exiles. Um, and I don't, I typically, you know, <laughs> I typically don't invite speakers to speak at Exiles to, you know, who've publicly called me a heretical liar. Like, that's just typically not my MO. <laughs> so I don't, I, 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 I was a little shocked that he was shocked that, I wouldn't have him speak at exile. So it kind of threw me off a little bit. So, um, yeah, anyway, I, I don't think there's much more I need to say about that. I just, I, I, that is one of the many times when I feel like, you know, I, I maybe made a comment that started to take us down a direction that I just wasn't really wanting to go. Uh, there were two other things I wanted to get to where I think, uh, where I would say Jared, I think is just grossly misrepresenting, uh, people to the point of lying about what people believed or was, um, and this has to do with, uh, uh, Rachel Gilson, who's a friend of mine. And, uh, he posted something about Rachel Gilson saying she legitimizes gay marriage. I'm like, what? This is the, that was so odd. Rachel Gilson has been extremely clear where she stands on the question of same sex, uh, marriage. Um, so I'm like, where are you getting this from? Like, I mean, she's written a book on it. She's written several articles everywhere. She speaks like I, I, I've never heard anybody even misread Rachel. So I was like, what is this clip that he has here? Is it, he has a seven minute clip of Rachel speaking. So I listened to it and I'm like, where are you getting this from? Even in the clip, like in the clip, it's, it's right. It's, it's a, during a Q and a time. Uh, during one of Rachel's talks and the, qu the person asking the question said it really is a, honestly, it was a beautiful pastoral moment where the person with the question said, Hey, um, I have two moms. They're married to, each I mean, two, you know, my mom's lesbians are married to each other. How do I think through this? It was a really genuine question from this, from this guy, like help me to think through this. I want to love, I love my parents, but I also don't agree with gay marriage. And so how do I navigate this? How do I love them without sacrificing my convictions? I mean, I'm kind of again, sum summarizing the gist of what he was saying. Um, and what would happen if they came to Christ? Like, do they divorce? You know, I don't think divorce is right or whatever. So it's that context that she was kind of interacting with. 
The only other, the, I mean, honestly, and I'm, I'm trying to say, where are you getting this? That Rachel is legitimizing gay marriage. The only thing I could think of, and this is what I wanted to hear from him, is that um, she, Rachel was working with, in her response to that question, was working with the assumption that the, this couple is legally married. Which is factually true. The law of the land is that two people of the same size can get married. That's the the law that the legal marriage by determined by the state. Now, both Rachel and I and probably many others would say that's one category of marriage. Now, that doesn't mean it's the- theologically correct. We, you know, it doesn't even mean they're quote unquote married before the eyes of God. But if they did come to Christ, there could be some legal decisions that need to be made. And maybe one option would be if they came to Christ, whatever, um, they would need to be legally divorced because they're legally married by the state. I mean, that's the only thing I could think that where he would say Rachel Gilson is legitimizing gay marriage. That's my best kind of good faith interpretation of um, Jared's interpretation of that. So I don't know. I thought that was just really really bizarre. Uh, but he's gone after, I mean, Sam, Sam Alberry. he's gone after, uh, Rebecca McLaughlin. He, I mean, there's, if you just, yeah, the, the few minutes I spent scrolling his, uh, feed, which I did for a few minutes and won't ever do it again. Um, I was like, Oh my word, this guy's just like attacking so many, I would say very conservative, um, Christians. Another area I, I did kind of want to get to was just the definition of heresy, and even that, like, I don't, I don't know, given kind of the nature of the conversation, would that even been profitable to talk about? Where are you getting your definition of heresy from? You're just slinging it around. Like, yeah, just, I think in ways that the early church wouldn't have recognized. You know, what's interesting is that the English word heresy comes from the Greek word, uh, hereticon. Hereticon occurs once in the New Testament, Titus 3.10. You know what it refers to? You know how you translate it? It's translated a divisive person, a hereticon. A hereticon is literally a divisive person. <laughs> and tied it, Paul says, you know, what do you say? They should be warned, warned twice before separating from him. So um, I'm not saying that's what the modern word heretic means, but those would be the ultimate kind of roots of that term. You see heresy used throughout church history. Irenaeus used, you know, he talked about the heresy of Gnosticism, which is heresy. Um, John of Damascus called Islam a heresy. Calvin and the reformers, um, you know, with, with a Michael Servetus called him a heretic because he was denying the Trinity. Like th- these are fundamental breaches, you know, against the basic Orthodox cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith. And to say, you know, that I'm a heretic because I believe that same sex sexual or same sex attraction, um, while being maybe part of the fall is not a morally culpable sin that people need to repent from. Um, but same sex lust is sin, same sex sexual behaviors are sin, all sin outside of a male female marriage is sin, like affirming all these things that are really fundamental, I would say, to a Christian worldview. Um, to say on these more finer points that I'm still a heretic, or because I invite speakers to a conference where there are differences of different viewpoints represented, and some speakers might put pronouns in their bio and therefore I'm a heretic. Like just that whole reasoning I find, I, yeah, I, I just find bizarre and uninteresting to really interact with. Um, so, and even the claim, like I didn't, I didn't even, I didn't even mess with the claim really, because again, I don't want to drag into some debate that was just unprofitable, but saying like church history disagrees with me, church history would have called me a heretic. That's just simply untrue. Like, um, the, the, my best faith interpretation of what he's saying is maybe his version of what I believe, which I obviously don't trust, <laughs> don't think is, um, close to what I actually believe. Maybe his version, the way he would summarize my beliefs and he'd go back and then his, he would interpret early church, his, you know, uh, early church writers or church writers, whatever to say, see, here's what they're saying, which I don't even trust that. I don't trust his interpretation of written texts. And then here's what Preston says, which I obviously don't trust that. And then therefore, so, I mean, you have to build a pretty, um, uh, interesting, um, case to say that my, the beliefs that I hold are deemed heretical by, by church history. Um, I mean, even the categories of like, sexual orientation weren't really, I mean, 
the categories themselves weren't really explored until the mid to late 18th century or 19th century. So the very category of same sex attraction as a kind of temptation that some people might wrestle with in distinguish, being distinguished from same sex lust, same sex sexual behavior, or even an act of desire to have sex with person of this, somebody of the same sex, like how you want to word it, the category of same sex attraction as distinct from all of those other areas that I, that's not something that the church writers were even, uh, those aren't the categories they were wrestling with. So, but anyway, that, that again, it's like, if I got dragged into that debate, it'd just be a, he said, she said, show me the text. I, you know, I'm interpreting that correctly. I don't know. I don't, I'll, you know, it, it would just not be profitable. So at the end of the day, my last point here is should I have done this? I honestly don't know folks. Uh, maybe, maybe not, you know, on the one hand I ignore, I mean, I, you know, uh, hardly a day goes by when, when somebody with a social media account and a keyboard and an internet connection, you know, calls me a heretic and, you know, I try to stay off that stuff so I don't see it all the time. But when I go, you know, if I Google my name, I'll come up with all kinds of weird stuff people say about me. So, um, and I just, I've gotten so used to just ignoring it. It doesn't, it honestly doesn't even bother me, any, me anymore. It's may, maybe the way I'm wired, maybe it's resilience. Maybe it's just because some of it's so just bizarre that it's like, I, I don't even give that a time of day. Um, and I have, I, I, I've, I've been able to ignore that for several years now, every now and then I'll slip up, make a comment. Um, you know, but I, I try really hard not to engage in these kind of conversations, um, on social media. So, so I do ignore that, but I, I don't know. I was, here's what I was thinking. I was saying once in a while, is there a place to call this stuff out? That, that was what I was thinking when I, when I invited Jared to come on the podcast I'm like, I don't know. Like he's just getting away with just saying things that saying what I believe that I just factually don't believe. Um, like, is there a place to say, no, you don't get to do that. Just because you have an internet connection doesn't mean you get to say you believe Preston Sprinkle believes this and whatever. And I don't believe that at least represent me correctly. And then call me a heretic. It's totally fine. I, I, that doesn't really bother me. Um, so that's what I was thinking. But honestly, I woke up the next day and I was like, 51% of me was like, I'm glad I did that. 49% was I know how this is going to go. It's going to be a waste of time. This is not going to be profitable. It's probably not going to be good for my soul. Not going to be good for his soul. Who's going to benefit from this? So yeah, on the one hand, I was like, is there a place to once in a while call this out? I don't know. Maybe on the other hand, I do think back and like, was this worth now the two hours of the time I put into it? Was there more profitable things I could have done for the kingdom in these two hours? And you know what? Probably so. Probably so. So with that, uh, speaking of more profitable things, my son is waiting to play ping pong with me right now. And here I am talking to all y'all. So I'm going to tune out, tune off, tune off. <laughs> I'm going to sign off and go play ping pong with my son. So thanks for listening to Theology Nara. And I hope, um, I hope, uh, I do. I hope that God might redeem the last two hours of the time you spent to listen to all this stuff. Um, and if not, I do apologize for wasting your time. Um, so hopefully the next podcast on Theology and Raw will be more, uh, more, more worth your time. So thanks for listening to Theology and Raw. We'll see you next time on the podcast. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.